everyone, and welcome to Southridge. If this is your first time joining us in this format, an extra special welcome to you. We also want to offer a few tips on how to make the most of this experience. Be sure to crank up the volume during the music and sing along. Don't worry, we can't hear you. Musicians, download the music charts below the video, grab your instrument, and play along. For any kids participating with us, don't worry if you don't know or can't read the words. Just sing, dance, or make music of your own. We're so happy when you join in with us. If English isn't your first language or you experience hearing challenges, we encourage you to turn on the closed captioning on this video or download the transcripts for this morning's message. And be sure to download the Southridge app. This is the best way to stay connected and informed about everything that's going on here at Southridge. It's completely free and super easy to use. For the next hour, I invite you to engage with this experience, just as if you were with us in person. You're surrounded by a community of diverse, curious, open-minded and inclusive people, all desiring to tap into the power and presence of God together as we worship, pray, listen, laugh and grow. There might be some things we do or say today that really resonate with you, and that's great. There might also be things that stretch and challenge you, and we think that's good too. Ultimately, we encourage you to engage openly, thoughtfully, honestly, and wholeheartedly, trusting that the God we're here to connect with is a God who above all else is love. So as we begin our time together, wherever and whenever you are, whether this is your first time with us or you've been around forever, we hope that for the next hour, you feel like you're among friends. Welcome to Southridge. We're so glad you're here. As we get started, we want to acknowledge the land that we're gathered on as a way to honor and bring awareness to indigenous peoples and their experiences. Long before European settler contact, the land now referred to as Niagara was a part of the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. And this land remains home to these indigenous groups and is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Treaty. We acknowledge that settler colonization has resulted in historical and ongoing impacts of oppression and injustice for Indigenous peoples. And as people who have disproportionately benefited from the actions of those who settled on this land, our hope is to contribute to new paths of reconciliation between Indigenous peoples and settlers. And encourage all of us to consider how we might work towards justice for all people and all of creation. To participate in this relational work, we invite you to join in our learning groups through the Becoming Good Relatives team, our Calls to Action response group, visits and meals to the Land Defenders at 1492 Landback Lane, and everything that we're all invited to at the Friendship Centers in Niagara-on-the-Lake and Fort Erie. Oh, 
when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop. I want you to imagine that it's snowing and you're driving on a country road. It's coming down pretty heavily and it's making it hard to see the road. Because you decided to take the back roads, you're heading down a country road in the middle of nowhere when all of a sudden you hit a patch of ice sending you spinning off the road into the ditch. So you get out to assess the damage, you try and see if there's anyone around, but the snow is falling so hard that it makes it difficult to see farther than a couple meters. So you grab a shovel from your trunk and you try and clear some of the snow surrounding the tires, but your hands are now getting numb and you just have to give up. A chilly realization begins to set in as you take in your surroundings. There's no cell reception, gas is running low, and you slowly realize you can't keep your heater on for much longer. For some reason, your phone map brought you a different route and you don't even have any idea where you are. It's getting colder and darker and the snow is piling up around your car by the minute. Things seem bad. Except, could it be there's one bar of service on your phone, so you take advantage and you quickly call for a tow truck. Now the service is spotty, but you breathe this huge sigh of relief as you hear the operator on the other end confirm your location and estimate a mere 20 minutes till a tow shows up. You hang up the phone and you can't believe your luck. And you look around, but this time it's funny, but things around you just seem different than they did before. As you lean against the hood of your car, the snow that once felt ominous and foreboding now seems nostalgic and comforting. You look up past the giant flakes into the dark gray sky overhead and realize how peaceful it really is out here. You uh, take a deep breath of the refreshing crisp air and drink in the beauty around you knowing help is on the way. Isn't it amazing how context changes perception? Knowing how things will end can dramatically change the way that we see things. There's a poem that we find written in the book of the Psalms that starts off like this. God is a safe place to hide, ready to help when we need him. We stand fearless at the cliff edge of doom, courageous in sea storm or even snowstorm. Later on in the same poem, it says, 
Step out of the traffic. Take a long, loving look at me, your high God, above everything. Some other translations say, be still and know that I am God. At Christmas, we don't just look back and remember a one-time event. We're practicing a hope in the fact that when Jesus came, lived, died, and was resurrected, that it changed everything for the rest of time. God's kingdom is here already and continues to unfold all around us. The tow truck is on its way. Where do you need to experience that hope in your life? What feels like a lost cause? Where have you given up? Where do you need a fresh injection of courage in the middle of a storm? Where do you need to be reminded that God is in control, that the kingdom is at hand, and that the tow truck has already been called? Over the next few moments, I want to invite us to together bring that before Jesus. We're going to practice this together, not fighting, not running, not panicking, but keeping still before God, knowing that the end is already written knowing that as we practice resting in Jesus, that we're simultaneously boldly declaring our hope in Jesus. So we're gonna spend the next few moments in silence. For some of us, that's gonna be really difficult, and for others, it might be a welcome break from the noise we've experienced this week. But for all of us, let's spend the next few minutes keeping still as we rest in the hope that Jesus offers to us. Baby 
sealed the promise Your buried body began to breathe Out of the silence The roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me Then came the morning that sealed the promise Your buried body began to breathe Out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave We are a diverse community of imperfect people who see the church as less of something to go to and more of a life to be lived and shared with others. We are continually growing in what it means to love one another, fighting for unity rather than fighting over unnecessary arguments. We are living to serve this world in the way of Jesus, serving those in need and those on the margins, knowing that friendship truly makes the difference. So if you're coming with questions or curiosities, hurts or frustrations, joys or celebrations, wondering if the church can bring clarity or hope, or simply be a place to belong, we invite you to be at home with us. We invite you to explore with us. We invite you to grow with us. And we invite you to belong with us. Welcome to Southridge. We're glad you're here. Hey everyone, my name is John Hand. I serve as the Interim Welland Location Pastor here at Southridge. We are so glad that you're participating with us today. We hope this has already been a meaningful time for you. So I'm here in our Welland location, and if you've never joined us for one of our in-person gatherings at one of our physical locations, we would love to have you consider joining us in person when you feel ready and able and while we're so grateful to have this online platform and share in this experience from wherever you find yourself, we love it even more when we can gather in person as a community. And in fact, if you do come out, please come and say hi to me or one of our other many volunteers because we'd love to give you a small gift and just say thank you for, for being a part of us on any given morning that you would visit. And even more as an incentive, we actually have our monthly welcome lunches for anyone who's looking to learn more about our community and wanting to connect with some of the folks and have a meal uh, after a service. So check out our events page on our website and see when the upcoming welcome lunch is happening. We'd love to meet you there. If for whatever reason you're not able to or not comfortable with joining us in person, please know that that doesn't actually exclude you from participating in this community. If you need to touch base with a pastor for any reason, please fill out one of our connect cards because we can't wait to hear from you. 
For those of us who call this community home, one of the ways that we practice togetherness and express our gratitude to God and our generosity to others is by regular financial contributions. And this is one of the ways that we can invest our lives in what God is already doing through our family, making a difference by meeting the needs among us in our church, but also across our region and around the world. All of our online giving options are available on our website. And so if you're able to give this week, we invite you to do so in a spirit of joy and generosity. And we thank you in advance for your faithfulness. Now, to help you stay aware of more opportunities to engage with our community or get involved, check this out. You've always heard that you were meant to make a difference, to change the world. You grew up learning about social issues and injustices. And you've been both dismayed and motivated by what you're seeing in the world around you. Through it all, you've continued to believe in that difference-making purpose. But how do you really live that life? When Jesus began his life's work, he announced that the very thing that he was sent for was to work for release, recovery, and freedom to those who are most vulnerable. Not just those who were insiders in his life, but specifically those who religion had left on the outside and power had oppressed. And everything that Jesus did brought that vision to reality. Jesus invites us to follow his example of making a difference and changing the world through relationship right where we are. At Southridge, we're learning to follow Jesus by accompanying friends experiencing homelessness, walking alongside migrant farm workers right here in our neighborhoods, aligning ourselves with our neighbors experiencing an unmanageable lack of affordability, growing in awareness and relationship with indigenous peoples of the lands we inhabit, and supporting those who are working to end poverty in their own communities around the world. In these friendships of mutuality, we've been experiencing that the difference we're meant to make is not just to change the world, it's to be changed. To be changed by people with different experiences than ourselves who uniquely reflect another facet of God's image. We're given the chance to realize that we all have something to offer each other and something to receive from each other. Every stage of life has its significant challenges, but those challenges don't have to prevent you from living a life of compassion and justice. The life you were meant to live right now. You can walk alongside others to change systems of inequity. You can provide support for real people in your neighborhood and around the world who are experiencing marginalization. And you are meant to be changed by friendships that truly make the difference for everyone, where cycles of poverty that keep us apart are broken as we support and learn from each other. At Southridge, we invite you to join in the anchor cause with us to both make that Jesus-like difference in the lives of others and to experience that difference in yourself. Well, that's it from me. So now we're going to hear this week's talk together. And as we do, I invite you to remove as many distractions as possible and to dial into what God might be wanting to say uniquely to you today. Well, the Canadian men's national team is playing in the FIFA World Cup literally right at this moment, kicking off against Croatia. So don't tell me the score. I'm going to watch it later. It's a big deal. I mean, it's exciting for Canada to be a part of the biggest sporting event in the world. Anywhere you go, soccer, or let's be real, calling it football makes way more sense. Come on. Football inspires stories and passion. So Swift Mpoloka Jr. grew up on the dirt football fitch- pitches of the Southern African country of Botswana where kids played with footballs made of like plastic bags melted together in tight layers, and there's thorn bushes around everywhere, and it meant that you had to be really careful when sitting down to watch. And every afternoon, the dust that was kicked up would just billow and just leave a fine powder on everything. Now in Botswana, the name Swift Mpoloka is synonymous with football because his father, Swift Sr., was a local star player for the Natwane Football Club. And he helped to develop the game in communities uh, just around the area where he lived. Now, sadly, Swift Sr. passed away relatively young, but Swift Jr. inherited that passion for football, especially through the passion to develop his community through football. Now, at a young age, Swift worked for FIFA FIFA during the 2010 World Cup in neighboring South Africa, learning about football development and starting to work on a plan for how to plant a football development center in Botswana. Now, it would take work with local communities in rough neighborhoods 
know, creating opportunities for kids not only to have fun and receive training, but also foster like other forms of education and create safe spaces for kids who are at risk. It would take a deft touch, you know, fostering relationships with the local Jotas, the tribal and elected leaders, the local schools, and local government. So Swift devoted years to this as a passion project. He worked on his funding structure. He built a team of fellow local young adults to help him run it, and he got ready to pitch it to the local government to see if they would support it. But before he started, a group of foreigners came into Botswana to do a missions project. Now they wanted to help local kids, so they pitched an exciting plan to the local government about turning overgrown lots into amazing places for children. Now their money moved things quickly, as well as the fact that they weren't slowed down by working with local leaders or the local community, and they were able to get the approvals that they needed for the project. Now at some point, for reasons of their own, they decided it wasn't for them and they left. Now they weren't from Botswana, it was easy enough to move on without completing the project. Now, but for Swift, you know, a local Motswana who for years had been building towards trying to serve his own community and give other kids a better chance than he had had, now he now faced a problem. You see, the local government, you know, generally already closed off to new ideas to begin with, had just been convinced to buy into a plan that was exciting and had good funding and had articulate, you know, foreign spokespeople. And Swift was local. And he didn't have the flash or the funding. And now as he finally approached them with the plan that he'd been working on for years, the local government pointed to the fact that they'd heard this before, you know, from a group that was a lot wealthier and had stuff together that, that he didn't have. And there was no chance that they were going to take a chance on Swift. So undermined by a missions project with a great idea and good intentions to help people in rural Africa, totally unknown to that group through their actions, you know, the door was slammed in Swift's face. Now, studies show that our good intentions in service, missions, charity, whatever you want to call it, the way that North American churches have long done are consistently, deeply harmful in ways that we don't easily observe. Now, according to Robert Lupton in his book, Toxic Charity, Christian good intentions through charity often don't have the impact that we intend, as they often don't you know, empower those uh, who are being served or foster healthy cross-cultural relationships, improve local quality of life, relieve poverty, or change the lives of participants. Statistically, they don't even tend to increase support for long-term work or increase missional engagement through the people going on the trips. You know, even when there's a legitimate need among people experiencing various forms of marginalization, which is systemically the case all around the world, well-intentioned solutions often perpetuate the need or even create new challenges for the people being served. You know, not only did it leave the local government feeling disrespected, it certainly created a new challenge for Swift and the children he was hoping to serve in his community. You know, studies show this is all too common and possibly even the predominant impact that Christians have in the ways that we serve. Now, as we're getting started here, you know, please don't hear me saying that there's no place for Christians to serve among people who are experiencing marginalization. Like, I'm all into it. Okay, my grandparents, Henry and Tina Dirks, spent 30 years serving alongside people in the Congo, where my dad grew up, leading my parents to eventually move our family to Botswana to serve among people experiencing various forms of marginalization, you know, where I grew up, leading my wife, and Taryn, and I to move to Botswana for the first number of years of our marriage and the first few years of our firstborn son's life to serve alongside people experiencing marginalization. You know, I've, I've led service-oriented trips to urban centers in the U.S. and Central America, hockey camp service trips within secluded northern indigenous communities, you know, short-term groups to Southern Africa. I mean, I believe in giving the best of our lives, the best of my life, to serving among people experiencing marginalization. But there are divergent perspectives which lead to divergent paths in how we can choose to live missionally as followers of Jesus. And one of which I believe embodies God's beautiful, loving restoration of the world, of all of us, like right now. And the other perspective causes massive harm. Have you ever heard residential school survivors talk about their experiences? And when they refer to the places that became their prisons as children and became the burial places for many others, do you know what they call it? They refer to it as their time at the mission. 
And these places were run for 160 years in the name of Jesus by people living missionally for Jesus. And within my experiences, I've lived out both of these divergent and contradictory missional perspectives. You know, some of the ways that I've parachuted into communities and done good things and left have probably perpetuated unhealthy systems more than they've actually helped the people that I was serving. And truthfully, sometimes I still reflect more of that attitude than Jesus-like behavior. And I want to be held accountable by our Southridge community and to hold each other accountable to increasingly, only living out the perspective that leads us to as Tom Lowen said last week, remake the world according to the glory of God. Not just good intentions, but actual good. So first of all, why and how do we so often get it so harmfully wrong? Have you ever heard the term doctrine of discovery? You might most recently recognize it from some of the media around the Pope's visit to Canada, uh, which happened earlier this year. It's a phrase that's in the calls to action that were offered by Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, where in call to action number 49, the TRC calls the church to repudiate the doctrine of discovery. The TRC instructs the church to actively name that there's a belief and practice that we have that we need to let go of so that we can't further harm people with it. Okay, so in the year 1514, uh, Pedrarius de Villa, a Spanish aristocrat and soldier, he stood on the deck of his ship as it floated off the coast of the New World in what's now the country of Colombia. Now, de Villa had in his possession a written declaration, and facing the land as they looked at it for the first time uh, and got within shouting distance, de Villa read the declaration out loud to whoever might be on the land that they were about to take for their own. So he read that, you know, if the people of the land would just acknowledge uh, that they were now subjects of the king and queen, yeah, don't worry, everything's going to be good. But if they didn't, you know, Davila read, I certify to you that with the help of God, we shall powerfully enter into your country and shall make war against you in all ways and manners that we can and shall subject you to the yoke and obedience of the church and their highnesses. We shall take you and your wives and your children and shall make slaves of them. And it goes on. You know, it was their statement of intent, and whether anyone actually heard was somewhat irrelevant. This declaration was just a part of the doctrine of discovery. The basic understanding, which is you know, then made into various legal codes and, and Christian theological doctrines even, that people not from Christian nations were not really as fully human as Christians. And so Christians had authority over them. And this belief and practice system was carried out in global colonization, the slave trade, it became a dominant framework for the Christian church of which we're a part of today. And it's a framework that we as Christians have never formally condemned and released from our grasp. In fact, it still informs the ways that we treat people around us who are different than ourselves. And at this point, not just people from different countries, but different cultural backgrounds or different socioeconomic backgrounds as well. People experiencing marginalization around the world and also in our own communities. Indigenous peoples, people experiencing homelessness, migrant farm workers, people with food and housing insecurities. And as the leaders of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission recognized, this is a framework that's still alive and well in the church, and it needs to be actively rejected in order for there to be a new and consistent impact. Within the framework of the doctrine of discovery, we may have good intentions towards others that we would define as less fortunate, but there are intentions because we have the authority to decide what's best for others. And you know, in this framework, you know, marginalized people groups are just, they're not quite like us. And they actually need us to decide what's best. You know, like Pedrarius de Villa calling out from his ship to the people on the shore, you know, whether they heard him or not, telling them what was best for them because of, of what they were about to do. We with good intentions towards those we would see as less fortunate. And you know, we decide from a distance what they need and we implement it. You know, charity, it's the same mentality. When Progerius de Villa told the indigenous peoples of the land he was about to invade, he was telling them what was good for them because he knew better than them, because he was better than them. You know, like residential schools, you know, saving indigenous peoples from themselves because the church knows better or a group arriving in Botswana and doing a project their own way and pulling out the plug on it in their own way because they know better. 
at the risk of confirming that I'm old, you know, I like the movie The Matrix. Now, in The Matrix, everything in the world around seems real, but it's actually just a computer-programmed illusion to keep us comfortably within the power of a controlled system. Like, friends, the doctrine of discovery is our matrix to this day. It's a system that we can't see because it's all around us. But within it, we do harm to others because we can't understand that we aren't the ones who get to decide what, for everyone else what they need, even if we have good intentions. So what's the path out of the doctrine of discovery to something greater, to the other perspective on living missionally? You know, indigenous author and Mennonite Sarah Augustine points to this divergence in our reading of scripture. You know, starting with the Great Commission. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. You know, this great commission, Augustine says, through systems of the church has empowered Christians to colonize the world. When we read this through the doctrine of discovery mindset, we hear the emphasis of you know, authority, me, make, obey, command. But she says, I do not hear a command for world domination. Because what does Jesus command? Love one another, love God with all your heart, uh, love your neighbor as yourself, love your enemies. You know, Augustine's response to this perspective on the Great Commission is from an indigenous elder that she had met uh, who said that mission should be an exchange of good news, an exchange of theology of life. You know, in this framework, the elder said, the Great Commission is a call to hear that the people we would aspire to serve are saying, we don't need help, we need relatives. You know, last week, Tom Lowen reminded us of the full participation that we're invited into as agents of movement and restoration on earth. You know, that's incredible. Right? We get to jump into full participation with Jesus and listen how Jesus explodes onto the scene in the scriptures. You know, the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. We saw the glory with our own eyes, the one of a kind glory, like father, like son, generous, inside and out, true from start to finish. And we get to participate in that. It's incarnational, observable, and relatable to the people around us. And Jesus immediately invites us to move from the condescension of our good intentions, set, uh, centered on like our will, you know, modern doctrine of discovery framework, to being embodied, humanized goodness, accompanying others. And Patty Crowick is a, is a friend of our community and she's a Jesus lover and Mennonite and she's had a lot of influence on us as a community. In her book, Becoming Kin, Patty says that the fact is that we are all related to everyone, no matter how different from ourselves, to people experiencing marginalization. What's up to us to do is to build relationships, you know, to, to learn how to love each other, to actually become kin. Kin is the word that she uses and I just love it. This is what Jesus calls us to. We don't need help, we need relatives. We need to become kin. We need to identify with people experiencing marginalization and become present with each other to the degree that we begin to relate to each other. Now, Jesus gives us that example by becoming flesh and blood and being in relationship with us. But Jesus also empowers us to do the same. In the Great Commission, Jesus has the authority, all authority, to invite and send us. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go. Go beyond yourself, be present with people like Jesus did with us. And he promises that in that authority, in that glory that John talks about seeing, Jesus is with us. He says, and surely I'm with you to the very end of the age. Jesus promises ongoing kinship with us and he invites us into that kinship of relationships of mutuality with others. In Botswana, in my friendship with Swift and Poloka, over the years, we ended up working on this vision that he had had and, and that we actually shared. You know, Taryn and I were able to accompany Swift, and despite the setbacks and barriers, you know, eventually we had the privilege of seeing this football development concept blossom into an incredible community center. It was even better than we'd actually dreamed of. You know, we spent time just praying together, and we envisioned together. We got annoyed at each other. We got to meet some of our childhood heroes together, and we really experienced that kinship with each other. And we continue to experience that with each other to this day. 
Friends, I've learned and have experienced that friendships, like what I'm fortunate enough to have with Swift, reflect God's intent for us. That's something that's only fostered over time with consistency. And I've learned that like, I'm invited to that right here, right now. I can't find that in a week-long trip to a community that I don't know, but I also don't need to find that in a community that I don't know. I need to experience that in my life today, here in Niagara. There are people that I've previously overlooked and we now mutually impact each other's lives here in Niagara. And through that, we get to impact the life of our community. Now this month, throughout our Hope Live series, we wanna talk about just that, about the ways that we can choose the path of kinship, a friendship that makes the difference in each other's lives and in the life of our community. That Jesus invites us to do this together as a family, invites us to live and breathe in these relationships day in and day out right here, that this is the way of Jesus. You know, all of what we're gonna be talking about, what I hope that you're gonna hear is that Jesus is calling us all to participate in daily mission permeated lives. That people living missionally are not just missionaries, like other people who are called to serve and foster friendships somewhere else. But that you are invited to live that life of calling relationally right here today. It looks like lives of mutual relationship. of not just offering help or charity or good intentions with less than good results. Now let's stop just offering help and let's learn to become relatives. You know, experiencing the real goodness, not of our own good intentions, but in the embodied power of Jesus together. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you that you help us to do better. God, thank you that even in the ways that we go down paths that aren't of you, God, the ways that we, uh, through the centuries, God, have uh, tried and often failed and often taken ourselves in directions uh, that don't honor you and don't honor just the beautiful peoples throughout all of your creation. God, I just thank you that despite those things that you invite us to do better, that you invite us into your kingdom and invite us into full participation with you in ways that we can impact each other, in mutuality, in ways that we get to see the face of Jesus in each other, in ways that we otherwise wouldn't be able to do. And I pray that we, as a community here at Southridge, would be able to hold each other accountable to that. God, that we'd be able to do better and that we'd be able to learn to love like you, Jesus, in the ways that we serve and love each other. Amen. by those that we love.
We are a community of imperfect people who desire to put into practice the good news that we preach. Our faith is not about an hour of watching or attending. It's about a lifestyle of full devotion to Christ. Not just a something to believe in, but someone to follow. We don't want to talk a good game on Sunday only to remain unaffected or ineffective for the rest of the week. So while we gather each week to sing, pray, listen, and learn, we know that an hour a week will never produce the life change that we so desperately need. It requires a daily investment of time and training. It takes practice. And practice. And more practice. And when we miss up, we forgive ourselves and each other. Then help each other up and keep practicing. As we go now, into the rest of our week. May we not just be hearers of the word, but doers also. May the Spirit of God fill us to make us kind and compassionate, honest and humble, generous and hospitable. Those who repay evil with good. Respond to injustice with action. Overcoming despair with hope. Let us be known, not by what we're against, but by what and who we are for. And most of all, let us love one another. Because God is love. It's been good to be together. But now it's time for us to go. In the name of the Father who loves us unconditionally. In the name of the Son who restores our true humanity. And in the name of the Spirit who empowers us to live life to the full. Amen. 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 Thank you for joining us today. We hope that you felt inspired and challenged by our time together. Now, we know that for what we've heard today to become reality in our daily lives, it's going to take more than this one hour a week that we spend together. It requires a daily, moment by moment, everyday commitment to practicing the way of peace and the way of Jesus. That's why we provide a host of ways to continue to lean into God's presence while we're away from each other. As always, you can click the Practice This Week button below the player for daily spiritual exercises to continue to develop the muscles we've started building today. If it helps, you can also opt into the Spiritual Practices notifications on our app to get those helpful reminders every morning as you start your day. As our time together ends, we're going to put some questions on the screen. If you're watching with others, they can serve as great conversation starters and can be adapted to have conversations with people of all ages but they can also be a great way of processing and personalizing what you've heard today on your own. If you'd like a more personal conversation with someone about anything that's going on in your life, please reach out to our location pastors who will follow up with you privately. You could also fill out a connect card, which you can find on our website or app. That's all for now. Thanks for joining us and have a great week. Bye.